The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. We exceedingly regret that due to unforeseen circumstances, Mr. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will not be able to address you on the subject of inflation on tonight's program has been announced. Mr. Parkinson will, however, speak on this subject over this same network at a later date. If you've been listening regularly to these FBI programs, such as tonight's case, which will open in just a moment, you have heard the word cooperation used a great many times. And that's because it's a key word in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Eighty-six years ago, a group of self-reliant men and women cooperated to found the Equitable Society to assure each member more security than any individual effort could provide. And now, the sound common sense of such an enterprise is revealed once more in the yearly report of the Equitable Society to its members. Just published, this report is so interesting that later on I want to tell you about this book. A book which proves once again that by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file, the Wasteland Hideout. Far more numerous than the so-called psychopathic killers and dangerous to more people are killers of the type dealt with in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Professional criminals to whom murder is merely another tool of their trade, who kill without cause, real or imagined, solely as a means to an end. They are indeed the dealers of sudden death. In a small cabin somewhere deep inside the blackness of the Bitterroot timber country, separating Idaho and Montana, a man sits before a rough table in the yellow glow of a lantern, clenching his left arm from which blood oozes. Eddie. Eddie. Yes? Hurry up with that pan of water, will you? Uh, right with you. I wish you'd let me heat this stuff first, Rocky. I don't want no fires. Well, it's night outside. Who's going to see? Look, you can see smoke against the sky at night. I don't want no forest ranger getting hep that anyone's here. Oh. Now, clean off this arm and get some bandage on it. Uh, are you sure the slug ain't still in there? I told you it went clean through. Oh. Well, just hold still, then. <clears throat> uh, how long you had this hideout? I picked it up five years ago. Uh, it sure is buried away. That's why I nailed it. Any hunting around here? Sure. Uh, how about fishing? Plenty. Hey, this is going to be a regular vacation, huh? Not exactly. We just go under here until the heat cools off. <laughs> Easy, will you? Oh, sorry. Uh, Eddie. Yeah? There's a job you're going to have to do. Uh, what's that? you got to rustle us some grub. You mean go hunting? Nah, stupid. you got to get some store grub. Hey, but you said there was plenty of hunting. There's plenty of guys hunting for us. We ain't running loose in these woods. Oh. Uh, where's the store? There's a joint about ten miles from here. Yeah. You got any dough? You don't use dough. You heist it. Oh. If I could make it, I'd go myself. But I can't, so I gotta send you. And look, just for once, do a job right, will you? Oh, now, Rocky, you know I... I know if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have this bum wing. Now, listen close. I'm gonna tell you how to get there, and you're gonna get it right if I have to spell every word. <laughs>
Pop Culwell's combination filling station and grocery store on the highway through the Bitterroot country is not too heavily patronized, but enough to keep him going. And the radio on the counter is enough to keep him company. Pop is sitting on a box in his store, reading a paper and listening to a musical program out of Spokane. Then suddenly... We interrupt this program of music, ladies and gentlemen, to bring you a special police bulletin. Well, what's that? All motorists and persons living on highways in the area comprising southeast Washington, northern Idaho, and southwest Montana are warned to be on the alert for two men who escaped from the federal penitentiary this afternoon after killing a guard. Well, what do you If you know? should see them, go to the nearest phone and call the police or the FBI. Under no circumstances, engage them in conversation. They will kill without provocation. Here are their descriptions. Edward Corning, age 35. Five feet Turn it off, mister. Huh? Turn it off. Weighs 100... Where'd you come from? I just walked in. You're... You're one of them fellas That's that just... That's right. What you want here? Groceries, a big stack of them. And I need a car, too. Well, you ain't getting neither one. Oh, no, you don't. <coughs> Jerk. Hey, Pop! Pop! Pop, I gotta get my girl home and... Hey, mister, where's Pop? Maybe I can take care of what you want. I gotta talk to Pop. I gotta get some gas on the cuff. Where is he? Don't come back here. Oh, it's okay. I always... Oh, gee. I told you not to come back here. What happened to him? He had an accident. Why, his head's bleeding. Leave him alone. You did this to him. Dick, are you going to take... Don't come in here, Midge. What's wrong, Dick? Stay back. Don't come in. <gasps> come on, Midge. L let's, let's get back in the car. Wait a minute. You're going to stay here and give me a hand. Now, look, this Mr. gun's given the orders. Oh. You're going to help me load some groceries. Then we'll all get in the car. How are you feeling now, Mr. Caldwell? Uh, I'm coming around all right, I reckon. Who are you, fellas? My name's Perry. This is Mr. Norton. We're special agents of the FBI. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Well, now, that beats all. How do you know I was in trouble? We didn't, Mr. Caldwell. Hmm? We're on the trail of two men who escaped from the federal penitentiary. Yeah, I know. I heard it on the radio. It was one of them that walloped me. Yes, we had an idea it was something like that. When did it happen? Well, it was... Right after 8 o'clock. That was only 30 minutes ago, Jim. Yeah. We can't be very far behind them now, especially since they're on foot. On foot? We found the car they stole down the road, abandoned, burned out bearing. What'd they come here for, Mr. Caldwell? Well, there's only the one came in. He wanted some groceries. Groceries? Yeah. Oh, then they must have a hideout somewhere up. Wait a minute. What is it, Jim? It's a girl's compact here on the floor. Well, no. Where'd that come from? The initials are M-E-L. You know who that might be, sir? M-E-L. Oh, sure, that, that can't be nobody else but young Midge Ellen Lancaster lives back in Summit. I see. And if she was here, then Dick Bosto, who's sweet on her, was... Here with her, for sure. Does he have a car? Yeah, he practically lives in one. And that accounts for the fresh car tracks outside by the gas pumps, Jim. Mm, probably means more than that, too. Uh, do the parents of these youngsters have phones, Mr. Caldwell? Yes, they do. All right, we'll call them, George. Right. And if neither of those kids is at home, the bandits have them in their car, too. No telling where they are by now. Let's get on that phone, quick. <laughs> Go slower, going back. We don't want to miss that turn off trail into the woods again, you hear? I hear you. Oh, Dick. 
If we'd only started for home before dark, like I promised Mother, this wouldn't have happened to us. I know. It's, it's all my fault. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Yeah, but it's true. Hey, look, pay attention to your driving, will you? Dick, Mother and Daddy will be out of their minds. Oh, don't worry about them. They're okay. It's us I'm thinking about, especially you. Oh, Dick. What'll we do? I know what we'll do. <laughs> Hey, what are you stopping for? Look, mister, I don't know what you're planning to do with us, but whatever it is, I'm not letting my girl in for it. You better start the car going again. I'm not driving another foot. I'm not taking... Hey, hey, hey. Oh. Shut up, both of you. Now, let's move. And like I said, go slow so we don't miss the turn-off trail to the woods again. Yes, sir. And try not to worry. I'm confident everything will turn out all right. Yes, we'll keep in touch with you. Goodbye, sir. Well, I guess that cinches it, Jim. Both kids are missing. Mm. While you're at the phone, George, you better get out an alarm on the car and the boy and girl. Oh, right, sure. Oh. Hello, operator. Oh, get me the FBI office in Spokane right away, please. Yeah, that's right. I'll hold on. Say, George. Yeah? Those car tracks outside turn around going out of the drive and head east. Now, if they kept driving steadily after leaving here, they couldn't have made more than 50 or 60 miles. What are you thinking? Let's get the office to contact police at all points 100 miles east of here. That'll block all roads ahead of them. Right. Then if we don't get a report back here in a reasonable length of time, we'll know that they've holed up somewhere in this area. Well, let's hope they keep driving through. Well, if they take to the tall timber, that'll be rugged hunting. Yeah, I, wait. I think I've got the office. Hello? Hello? This is George Norton. Get out an alarm right away on this car. Black Ford Sedan. <laughs> okay, stop here. Get out, both of you. Come on, Midge. We have to do what he says. Dick, I, I'm scared. Just, just hold my hand. Walk ahead of me. Head for the cabin. Come on, get moving. Dick, what are we going to do? We'll get out of this some way. Don't worry. I hope you're right. Yeah, this is it. All right, inside, you kids. Eddie, what is this? Oh, hiya, Rocky. <laughs> Did you think I was never coming back? Who are these kids? They brung me here. What? I used their car. Oh, you stupid. I had to, Rocky. Why? Well, they come in the store right after I slugged them. Slugged who? The grocery guy. Oh. Well, you sent me for groceries, didn't you? Look, mister. Shut up. I won't shut up. We want to go home. Eddie. This puts us in a real jam. Well, I couldn't help it, Rocky. Anybody see you take those kids? Anybody tell you? No. Are you sure? Yeah, there wasn't anybody in the joint but the grocery guy. Look, what else could I do? You could <laughs> drop dead. And sister, cut out the crying. Not till you let us out of here. That ain't gonna happen, sweetheart. What do you mean by that? You're staying here, Junior. No. No. Shut up. <laughs> Why, you dirty... Easy, Junior. Oh, no, I'm okay. gonna... Hey. Oh, Dick. Hey, let's eat something, Rocky. I'm hungry. In a moment, we'll reopen tonight's FBI file. Meanwhile, let's open another important record. This week at the Equitable Society, the advertising manager handed me an attractive little book. Here, he said, you might like to look this over. It's our annual report for 1945. Well, I expected to see the usual columns of dry figures. But this Equitable Society report was something else again. It was a 24-page book, bright with color, sparkling with interesting facts. Its title is Your Policy. 
And as, as I read it, I thought, here's one of the most forceful tributes to cooperation I've ever seen. It just shows what people can accomplish when they honestly and willingly work together for protection and security. Of course, this book, Your Policy, will be mailed automatically to members of the Equitable Society. But let me give all of you listening tonight some of its highlights. This book explains how the Equitable Society's investments aid government, industry, agriculture, homeowners. In short, how the society, by serving its members, serves America. The book tells about the $238 million that the Equitable Society paid out in 1945, paid to widows and children, paid on endowments, paid in annuities, paid in dividends to millions of members. It tells what every war veteran should do to keep his National Service life insurance in force. And it tells you how your Equitable Society representative is trained to serve you in many, many ways. This isn't all it tells, but it's enough to prove to anyone that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, the Wasteland Hideout. When fugitive criminals keep on the move, they're in the open, and their capture is largely just a matter of keeping on their trail until they can be overtaken. But when they go underground, when they hole up in some unknown hideout, the job of capture is not so simple. And if, as in tonight's case, the unknown hideout be somewhere inside several million acres of mountains and timber, the job may present a staggering handicap. Some two hours have now passed since the man called Rocky struck down the boy, Dick Barstow, in the hideout deep inside the Bitterroot Timber Country. Back at Pop Caldwell's filling station and grocery store on the highway, actually only ten miles as the crow flies from the hideout, Special Agents Perry and Norton of the FBI are studying a map and hoping the phone will ring. They couldn't possibly have had more than a 50 or 60 mile start from here when you put out the alarm, George. Yeah, I know. We've got police and deputies covering all roads east of here. I don't see how they could have gotten through. Still, the phone doesn't ring with any report. Mm. Then that's got to mean only one thing. They've stopped traveling. Here's some hot coffee for you, boys. Oh, thank you, Mr. Caldwell. Take milk and sugar in it? No, not for me. Oh, thanks. Say, Jim, Hmm? if they've taken to the tall timber, what do we do now? Well, I'm afraid there's not a great deal we can do tonight. We stand a much better chance in daylight of finding some trace of where they might have turned off. And let's be up at the crack of dawn and get at it. Right. You know something, boys? What's that? It'd be mighty funny if them convicts wasn't much more than spitting distance from here. Heaven. Oh, oh, my head. Lie still, Dick. Don't try to move. Mitch, what are you doing here? I mean that... Oh. Please, Dick, uh, just lie still. Where are we? What happened? Don't you remember? Remember? Remember what? Never mind. Don't try to think. I'm just so happy that you're alive. I... I thought that horrible man had killed you. Killed me? What are you talking... Hey, wait a minute. I remember now. He slapped me and... and you started to fight him. And he slugged me? Yes. How long have I been out? All night. What? Look outside. It's daylight. Are we still in the cabin? Yes. Where are those men? 
They went outside a few minutes ago. Hey, then... Then maybe we can get out of here. No, please. They're just down by the car. I can see them through the window. Oh. Dick. Yeah? I don't think we're ever going to get out. What do you mean? I heard them talk. They're escaped convicts. They killed a guard and then got away. They're very desperate men. Pop probably got killed, too. Yes. Dick? Yeah? If that's how it's going to be, they may kill us, too. And, well, there's something I want you to know. Yeah? Remember the night at, at the school dance? You, you asked me something? Yeah. About, about us getting married someday? Uh-huh. I didn't know the answer then. But I do now. Thanks, Midge. <laughs> oh, Dick. <laughs> oh, don't, Midge. Don't cry, please. If we're gonna have to die, then... Hey, wait a minute. Maybe we are gonna have to die. What? L let me get up. What are you going to do? I've got an idea. If those men only stay out of here long enough, it might work. Well, George, we've cruised up and down this road for 20 miles and still no sign of where any car turned off up in the woods. Well, they must have covered up any signs like that. I'm afraid so. Hey, I've got an idea. Yeah? If they've got a hideout in the timber, it must be an old trapper cabin or a hut in an abandoned logging camp. Uh -huh. So we start looking for all the cabins scattered through several million acres of tall timber. No, no, we can make the job easier than that. How? Oh. There's a forest ranger lookout up in there, and he's probably got every cabin spotted on a map. Say, you're right. Let's go see him right now. You FBI fellas have picked out a pretty good job for yourselves, I'd say. How do you mean? Reducing the area where the killers are likely to be hiding, even to that smallest circle. Yeah? I'd say there are probably 30 or 40 cabins sprinkled around in that area. Well, uh, I, I realize it's a lot of legwork, but it's got to be done. And one of them might be the one we want. Okay. Here's your map with the cabin spotted on it. Good. And I'll get a guide for you, and that'll save Sorry. time and... Look. Where? On that ridge, right over there to the east. Mm -hmm. uh, it's smoke from a cabin. I saw it just before you fellas drove up. Yeah, but look at it now. What about it, George? Somebody's doing something with that smoke. What? Yeah. Looks like somebody was trying to signal with it. Yeah. Say, where is that on the map? I can locate it in a second on the fire finder here. Good. Jim, if that smoke is coming from a cabin in the circle we laid out, it'll be the first one we go to. And in a big hurry, too. Well, that's that. Why'd you drive the car way under them trees, Rocky? So nobody could spot it. Nobody could see it where it was. From the air they could, that car's red hot. They'll use planes or anything to find it. Oh. Hey, Rock. Yeah? Did you start a fire this morning? What are you talking about? Look. There's smoke coming out of the chimney in the cabin. What? Yeah, see it? Come on. Hey, what's the matter? The kid started that. Oh, I thought... Shut up and hurry. Put that fire out, kid. It's too late now, mister. Give me that bucket of water, Eddie. Right. Here you are. There. What'd you set a fire for, kid? I know what he set it for. How long you been at it, kid? Long enough, I hope. Well, we're not gonna stick around to find out. Are we leaving, Rocky? Yes, yeah, stupid. Uh, what are we gonna do with them? What you should have done at the old man's place when they came in, if you had any brains. Dick! Wait a minute, mister. You got no time to argue now, Junior. Look, kill me or do anything you want to, but let her go, please. Not a chance. Drop that gun, you. Rocky, look out. I'm not dropping any gun. Oh. Rocky. 
All right, keep this other man covered, George. I'm sorry, young lady, that you had to see that. <laughs> Thank you, mister. We're special agents of the FBI. And I imagine uh, they were your smoke signals, huh, son? Yes, sir. Good work. And now we're going to take you both home to your folks. Come on. Rocky and his accomplice in crime were tried for the murder of the prison guard. They were both convicted for this crime and sentenced to death by hanging. And so ended the career of two more dealers of sudden death. There are, however, many more of their kind still at large. Unfortunately, neither your local law enforcement officers nor your FBI know just who and where they all are, nor when any will strike. But of this, you and they may rest assured. When one does strike, he'll be pursued day and night, 24 hours around the clock. And let him hide out wherever he chooses. He will be found. In next week's exciting program, which we'll tell you about in just a moment, this is your FBI, will present new evidence to prove how well the FBI guards national security. And in the booklet called Your Policy, the same one I was talking to you about a few minutes ago, the Equitable Society presents new evidence to prove how carefully and intelligently the society protects your financial security through life insurance. If you're not already a member of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, ask the Equitable Society representative in your community for a free copy of this booklet. It's so interesting, so easy to read. Get a copy from your Equitable Society representative, a neighbor whom you ought to know anyway, for like your FBI, he is constantly working for the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Bogus War Brides. We exceedingly regret that due to unforeseen circumstances, Mr. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, was not able to address you on the subject of inflation on tonight's program as had been announced. Mr. Parkinson will, however, speak on this subject over this same network at a later date. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time, when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Bogus War Bride. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.